Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. If you're a chicken, this is a pandemic. So said Dr. Julie Gerberding, director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, while discussing the H5N1 influenza strain, more commonly known as bird flu, currently making its way around the globe. The facts clearly support her point of view. Over the past nine years, H5N1 bird flu has been responsible for the deaths of about 200 million chickens, ducks, and geese, either through infection or through steps taken to destroy domestic birds in the hopes of containing the spread of this disease. While the media has largely focused on the human dimension of bird flu over the last year, most of us know very little about what's really going on as the virus spreads from bird to bird. Some things might surprise you. As documented, 87 species of birds have been infected with H5N1, including sparrows, flamingos, and eagles. First recognized in 1961 in South African terns, this flu appears to have found a natural host in wild ducks, some of which can carry the virus without dying. This is certainly perpetuating the spread of the disease because, obviously, dead birds don't fly. So there's little question that bird flu is on the move. In the past year, it's extended its range from eastern China to western Africa. Most experts say its arrival in the Americas is inevitable. It could make its way here through migration patterns in the Northwest as infected birds travel through Alaska to the West Coast, or it could appear on the East Coast or in any major city with the illegal trade of exotic birds. What's scary is that one important aspect of bird flu continues to elude and confuse us. How does the disease spread? Are wild birds or domestic birds to blame? It's not 100% clear. But what we do know is that in domestic bird populations, especially chickens, this virus is lethal. This type of susceptibility, combined with the fact that chickens are now mass produced and distributed globally, creates an ideal environment for spread of the disease. In fact, a recent outbreak of H5N1 in Nigeria was traced back to chicks bred in China and Turkey. What makes this especially confusing is the fact that wild birds are not necessarily dying out in large numbers in the same areas as domestic birds. Thus, the unpredictable pattern of spread has led some experts to hypothesize that carriers, like mass-produced chicks, pass the disease by mingling with domestic flocks, migratory birds, or perhaps intermediary scavengers like crows or miners, who in turn carry the disease from the chicken coop to their next location, and on to other birds. So we've established that birds, at least at this time, are the most vulnerable to H5N1, and that the disease is spreading. What we don't know is whether it will become a human pandemic. At least at this point, H5N1 bird flu is not easily transferred from one human being to another. If you're unlucky enough to get it, though, Usually from handling infected fowl, experts agree it's a very nasty virus. In other words, it's killed about half of its known human victims. When it comes to discussing the disease's potential for mass spread, opinions diverge. On the one end of the spectrum, we have experts like David Nabarro, the United Nations Chief Avian Flu Coordinator, who says bird flu's, quotes, rampant explosive spread and the dramatic way it's killing poultry so rapidly suggests that we've got a very beastly virus in our midst. This has led to an exponential increase of the load of the virus in the world, close quotes. What Dr. Nabarro suggests is that the greater the load of the virus, the greater the number and speed of the mutations, allowing the virus to eventually figure out how to do to humans what it's doing to birds. Now, on the other end of the spectrum are practitioners like Dr. Jeremy Farrar, who has hands-on knowledge of the disease in humans. Working at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in Ho Chi Minh City, he's in the middle of the action since 93 of the 186 documented human cases of bird flu have occurred in Vietnam. According to Dr. Farrar, quotes, billions of chickens in Asia have been infected, and millions of people lived with them. 
and less than 200 people have gotten infected. That tells you that the constraints on the virus are considerable, close quotes. Yes, you say, but could that change, and when? To answer those questions, many have been looking back at H5N1's cousin, H1N1, which in a few short months in 1918 killed more U.S. citizens than World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. That virus was a bird flu that jumped to humans and resulted in an estimated 40 million deaths worldwide. It spread across the globe rapidly, even without mass air travel, sparing only Australia and a few remote islands. Yet even though we know the entire genetic code of the 1918 flu, that seems to be where most of our knowledge stops. We don't know how that pandemic evolved or how the virus emerged into its final form. The man who helped piece together the genes of the 1918 flu, Dr. Jeffrey Taubenberger, says that what he and his colleagues sequenced was a virus ready for prime time, not its precursor. He says there's no historical precedent for what is going on today. This last remark refers to the fact that there were no documented reports of large deaths of migratory or domestic birds that preceded the 1918 pandemic, leaving one to wonder, where did it come from? Did it mix with a human virus or mutate on its own? How did it jump to humans? The one thing we do know is that it spread fast in 1918 and would likely spread much faster in today's high-speed global society. But if there's a bright spot here, perhaps it's this. In 1918, the bird flu did not appear to be as lethal in birds as it was in humans. Remembering that dead birds don't fly, the fact that birds in 1918 survived to both mix and transport the virus may have sealed the fate of some 40 million humans. In contrast, Today's virus, H5N1, is extraordinarily lethal for birds, which may be bad for the birds, but it's probably good for us. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. If you are accessing Health Politics with a portable device, please visit our homepage, healthpolitics.com, for more information on this topic and many others. If you are watching Health Politics on the Internet, please visit the links below for additional information. Download the transcript and slides to share with friends or colleagues, or use the discussion guide to help generate conversations in the classroom. If you are not yet a Health Politics subscriber and would like to begin receiving a weekly email to keep you up to date on our latest programs, please click on Subscribe to Health Politics above and enter your email address. Again, Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee.